Our next speaker uh, is Maxie Pia Lewis. And Maxie has dedicated her life to the environment and protecting it while developing strategies to improve the lives of Namibian people through tourism. And in 1995, she was the founding member of an organization that um, called the Namibian Community-Based Tourism Association, or NAXO. And as the director of the Namibian Association of CBNRM support organizations. So NAXO is a member of the International Advisory Board, Adventure Travel and Trade Association, and she's been a leader in the development and implementation of Namibia's um, celebrated community-based natural resource management policies. I'm very lucky to have known Maxie for mm, 25 years, if not 30. She has been um, awarded by the Cheetah Conservation Fund as one of the um, Cheetah Conservationists of the Year. She is well known globally to bring the story um, to the world about what we're doing here in Namibia. Thank you, Maxie, for being here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Lori Marker. My name is uh, Maxie Lewis, as I'm introduced. And just an apology, I'm not uh, John Kasauna. I think you went through the program. <laughs> um, there has been some change, as Sam just alluded. Um, one thing that we are very good at as Namibians is that we can adapt quickly, okay? Adaptive management is something that, is, that we are very good at. Um, I'm going to share with you um, a journey. And that journey is a journey that we have made as partners uh, through a program called the Community-Based Natural Resource Program. And so I think Sam has actually created that enabling environment for me just get into the practical side of that journey. So I'm going to share with you guys the Namibian story in terms of the Namibian community conservation journey. So in Namibia, uh, first of all, first um, on the first slide, I just wanted to explain that um, we in Namibia, um, we work very much in partnership and that's why in some ways we had this successful program, the successful program, but we also have our fair share of challenges. I think our successes have also become our challenges. So um, as we work as partners, and when I talk about partners, I work for an NGO uh, network called NAXO. Um, that network also partners with the Ministry of Environment and Tourism. Um, and then we also partner with our private sector. So we just don't work in, um, in silos. Um, anything that we do um, is very much in partnership. Um, that partnership then also form what we call our vision, um, the community-based natural resource program of which we are partner uh, have a vision. And the vision is that we would like to make sure that uh, we empower um, our present generations, but also our future generations in terms of understanding um, issues around conservation in general, but also making sure that um, in Africa that we value um, natural resource management is another option, um, especially as a development option. So that's what it is all about. And it's a vi it's, it's, that is a vision that we all share um, in, in Namibia. Uh, next. Now, I, I think you are here and you know where we are. I don't have to go through that slide. The only thing I need to share with you is that in Namibia, everything is two million. Eh? We have two million people, we have two million goats, we have two million sheep. That's how it is. So this is a very unique country. Okay. Now, we also have a history which is also not very nice, and most people actually don't, un don't know this history, that we as Namibians were part of uh, a history that was part of the apartheid system. And from a conservation point of view is that um, that system had very significant consequences on uh, people and also wildlife. 
So, um, that actually means that because of that system, there was a lot of, you know, poaching in terms of wildlife because it's a system that alienated people from, you know, be part of natural resources, being part of wildlife management. So as a, as a result, that there was a lot of poaching. The communities that we work with, um, that we partner with, have been part of that poaching system, and that started way back as part of that apartheid system. So as a result, um, I want you to move a bit. Good, yeah. Um, there also, um, as a result, there has been other people that work within that system. I think you know that gentleman um, down there, if you come to Namibia, that's one of the names that pop up when you talk about conservation in this country, and especially when you talk about uh, community conservation, that is Garth Owen Smith. We call him the father of conservation in Namibia. He's a very remarkable old man now. Him and his partner uh, has been very, very, um, they've been involved in conservation for quite a long time. And some of the programs that I'm going to share with you, they have been part of that. So there have been people, even when that system was there, that nobody could take part. These were people that remarkably made the difference in terms of making sure that uh, we had this vision together. Next. Um, there were also other people, um, John Kasana, that will hopefully make his way tomorrow morning here. Um, his, this is his father. Um, his name was Joshua Kasawana, and in the late 80s, if you wanted to poach rhinos, he was known as part of the network, the poaching network in Namibia, that if you wanted black rhino and you wanted black rhino in the Northwest, this is the guy to go to. His name was Joshua Kasawana. But through influences from the guy like oh, Garth Owen Smith, um, he then became our first community game guard, and to date, we have over 600 community game guards. These are people that are in rural areas that actually look after wildlife by themselves and not employed by government. So um, Joshua, for us, is one of those pioneers that started that program and became that game guard. And he, John's father, so John is a big, is one of our biggest conservationists, and his father was a poacher. Okay. And then there was another one. Um, as we had, um, we came from a system of apartheid also. People went into exile. A lot of um, our people, the youngsters that you see, like Sam, Shikongo, them, they were not in country around that time. Some of them came back after independence. And uh, when they came back after independence, they were either in East Africa or in Southern Africa somewhere in exile. They came back and they learned from those countries. So when they were back, they came back, and this guy was from the royal house, somewhere close um, in the eastern part of the country, which is called the Sambezi region, a remarkable guy. I was very fortunate to have worked with this guy for 15 years, he's now late, and um, he's one of those guys, he was an academic, but somebody who could really influence strategies in terms of how he wanted this program to, to actually run. And he influenced the royal houses in that part of the country to make sure that conservation was uh, valued as a development option. Um, that vision, that common vision then, um, was giving ownership to people, and that is what is key. Um, um, for, for us, the issue of ownership and, um, and people living, living with wildlife is very key. So instead of seeing communities as a problem, we actually started seeing them as a solution to our problem. Now, I was overhearing here, I was not part of the training, that a lot of the conservationists are people that are not so people orientated. But um, I think in today's world, if you work with wildlife and you cannot communicate with people, I cannot see you going anywhere. <laughs> so I think um, that's what made us to be quite successful is the issue of sharing information, communicating, and making sure that communities are involved <laughs> from the grassroots. I, you know, one thing that Laurie did not tell you, I have the most difficult job. The job is that I need to make sure that the politician talk to the community, the community talk to the politician, the private sector talk to the community, the community talk to the private sector, and then the NGOs talk to everybody else. So it's not a very easy job, and if you work with human, or human dimensions, it makes it even more difficult. Now, 
also just to share with you, because of that alienation, communities were not very friendly in this country towards wildlife. Um, for instance, if I can give you some practical examples, and this is the human conflict um, examples that we have in Namibia. Um, if you have communities living with wildlife, this is not parks, and that, that's what I need to make clear. These, these communities where this wildlife is roaming at the moment is not parks. This is open landscapes. So they, 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 they you know, the elephants destroy their crops. At the, you know, in the late 90s and 80s. So why would I like to have something that is destroying my crops or my water course um, and I don't have any benefits? So why would I have that around me? Why would I have um, a cheetah or a leopard or anything that is actually, you know, catching my livestock and eating my livestock to have that around my landscape? So in the late 80s and 90s, we did not have the same spirit as we are having now. Everything that was wildlife, and especially elephant, lion, rhino, and leopard, and joko were the biggest enemies if you went into these communities. And that now changed. Um, what we did is that, as I said, we work in partnership. We put up a task force. This is our first Minister of Environment and Tourism. And he was uh, a champion, and somebody who took risks. He's, you know, he said, you know, the only way that we can change this environment first is to look at our legal environment. And our legal environment was an environment that did not allow communities to participate in you know, wildlife management issues, in natural resource management issues, in making sure that communities have benefits. So he took a risk, and he actually um, influenced all his other uh, politicians saying, you know, we have to change the laws. If we change the laws, then we will give the communism an opportunity to participate. And that will change the whole landscape in terms of wildlife management. And so that's what he did. Um, so the next slide will show you that then we changed into this piece of legislation. Um, and this piece of legislation then gave rights to communities to be able to get involved in, in uh, you know, wildlife management and conservation issues. And this was a very strong piece of legislation. Uh, we are just revising it now after 20 years. Uh, we have uh, really successfully implemented it. But also, if you see on the right-hand side, um, just by changing that piece of legislation, we were awarded uh, an award by WWF at the time just um, to thank Namibia for really allowing to um, having um, that legislation actually um, passed. But also for your knowledge is that I think we are the, the, f the first African country to have uh, in our constitution um, the protection of the environment in our constitution. So those were things that our politicians um, actually took risk and included this as part of the legislation next. So um, this is um, what I think I've already talked about this. Can you just skip that? Yeah. So um, in Namibia, um, and I'm trying to get now to the practical part of it, is that we have from the institutional part, uh, as part of the partnership, we have uh, three pillars that we work on. Um, on this program called the Community-Based Natural Resource Program. One, the first, our foundation is natural resource management. So that's the, the key. And the second one is looking on issues of institutional governance and development. Then the other one is looking at issues of business development and livelihoods. So that's, those are the three uh, pillars, but we also call them the three-legged pot. When we are in the communities, we refer to that as the three-legged pot. On the natural resource side, um, our achievements to date has been increased wildlife populations, and we have done that, especially in areas where there has been, um, in the late 80s, um, let just to give you an example, especially with the black rhinos, we nearly had black rhinos in that part of the world to an, ex an extinction. Today, um, we have quite a number of black rhinos that are roaming that landscape, and that is because of some of the conservation efforts. Um, we have also created very large landscape connectivities. We have around, and I will share with you, 82 
um, no, 83 now, 83 um, conservancies, and those conservancies are open landscapes that connect to each other, which is open landscapes for wildlife to move on, so they, we have no fences in between, so wildlife can actually move. On the governance side, um, we have uh, also what we call 83 elected governance structures. These are the communities and they are called conservancies. Um, and that represents one out of uh, 11 Namibian citizens. Um, when you calculate very few people, so it's a significant number of people that are participating. And then one of the uh, biggest thing is that we make sure that we encourage strong gender empowerment as part of the program. Um, the livelihoods part um, is that tourism um, is the biggest uh, income towards those communities. So we have um, sustainable wildlife use, which um, we refer in this part of the world as hunting. Um, um, we, do, we do hunting, but it's being done very much in a sustainable way. Um, we have systems in place um, to make sure that it's well managed. Uh, by the community, so, um, and if you are interested, I think some of my colleagues will be here this week to share some of those systems that are being used to make sure um, that there is no overuse of, of certain species. Then we have uh, campsites, crafts, um, guides, and info centers, um, and, and when you go to the northeast, mostly traditional homesteads. And then we also have uh, where our biggest income comes from the joint venture lodges. These are photographic tourism lodges uh, where communities signed uh, partnerships with an investor or they run their own uh, uh, tourism lodges. Um, so we have different type of uh, um, lodges um, that, that, that is being run at this part, that part of the, of the communities. So this is, um, sorry you cannot see very well here, but this is um, the um, income, um, showing the total income um, over the years um, that has been generated um, by this program. Our first four conservancies were registered around in 1998, and over the years that has increased um, with around uh, close to 200, plus minus 200,000 people that are participating. This is a voluntary program. No community is supposed to participate. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, the income um, is uh, cash that goes directly to conservancies themselves and they manage uh, the funds themselves. I'm sure you have met some of my colleagues here that come from those conservancies and they can share that information with you how it works. And then they, some of them even have cash benefits towards the members themselves. And then the other ones are non-cash benefits, whether it's meat that is coming from a hunt or any other services that are being uh, provided by the conservancy or by the joint venture partner. Uh, what has been the impacts as part of this? Um, there has been quite a lot of uh, economic development. Um, this is a vast country, 840,000 square kilometer, most of it quite uh, very dry, semi-desert, semi so we don't, it's not, it's not like in other countries where you can really grow things. So, um, and that's why um, um, conservation and tourism um, is very important to those communities as a livelihood. So, um, uh, as, a, as a program, I think we have made quite a lot of uh, impact in those communities, creating local economies for them to be able to stay in rural areas because urbanization, as you all know, is a big problem all over the world, including Ventu, where you are now. Um, we have also improved rural livelihoods. Um, people have um, diversified their income rather than uh, most of our communities are um, livestock owners. Uh, they depend on agriculture. Uh, and that puts a lot of pressure on the environment by di diversifying those economies, making sure that we don't really just derive a lot of income from, from the environment or the natural resources or from the wildlife. Um, um, it creates a um, lot of employment, for instance, in rural areas. Um, uh, these conservancies contribute to schools and clinics. Um, the other thing is also as we improve water, um, provision to wildlife, uh, at the same time we also supply waters to communities for other uses. Uh, conservancies are the big economic uh, hub for communal areas, so 
transport is a big issue in this country. You will see when you travel, I don't know how many of you have traveled, but uh, travel here is no joke. It's distances and distances, uh, but we have very good roads. Um, support to home gardens, um, but also improvement in terms of nutrition, especially from a health point of view. And then uh, the biggest one, and this is where I think you guys are here to discuss, is the issue of human wildlife conflict mitigation. Because with that income, we have created schemes by which communities have, uh, can be paid for some of the losses. Um, still a big debate within the country, and uh, hopefully for this week we'll be able to probably come up with some um, good examples that we as Namibians can use to address some of these. It's a very contentious issue in, in this country at the moment, and you open up the newspaper every day. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's headline news. I mean, we probably don't have other news, so that's what is coming forward. Uh, improved natural resources management, um, and you see the landscape has really improved. I'm one of those children that knew these countries uh, since the last drought in the late 80s, and I have seen quite a lot of improvement in terms of resources um, over the years. The biggest thing is creation of a voice. These communities have a conservation voice where they can talk about the conservation issues directly to their politicians. They can go to the president and then talk to the president that they are unhappy about certain things that are happening, and not just unhappy about human wildlife conflict. Sometimes when there's other issues that are of a conservation concern to them, they can actually have that voice themselves. They don't have to talk through NGOs, they have to do it. Um, yes, uh, we have challenges. Human wildlife conflict is one of those challenges. Um, the drought, we are going through a big drought now for the past 10 years, um, and so that is a big issue. Uh, we are being criticized a lot around the issue of uh, um, sustainable use, um, and so um, it's a big one. I'm sure my colleagues will also share that with you. The issue of poaching, we did not know poaching for more than um, 27 or 24 years, and suddenly poaching is coming back. So with the question that we are asking ourselves is that, where did we go wrong? What are we not addressing? So what did we, we, we need to go back to basics. That's what we need to look at. The other one is that we are being regarded as a middle income country, and as a result, there's not much funding coming to uh, support wildlife uh, uh, conservation in Namibia anymore. So that is a problem. And I think the last one is the issue of uh, land use conflicts, uh, different land uses, different policies. I'm sure everybody struggle with this one. That is also an issue with us. So I think this is where I'm ending my presentation. But I've also just left, if I'm allowed by the organizers, a six minute video for you just to, if you have not visited this country, I know some of you will probably not have the time to travel. I would like to share with you uh, just a six minute video in terms of Namibia and the program that I just shared with you. Thank you so much and thank you for visiting Namibia. of the 42%. 42%, it's my land. It's my choice. It's, it's our, our future. future. Forty-two percent is the amount of land under conservation management in Namibia. Nowhere else in the world comes close to this degree of protection. But 42% isn't just a number. It represents a courageous choice made by people in a young democracy. In a short time, this choice has created a profound culture of conservation in Namibia. 42% isn't just changing landscapes, it's changing lives. I'm part of the 42%. It means conservation. It means hope for endangered species. 42% is about wildlife and wild places.
42% covers nature in its extremes. Namibia's stunning mosaic of national parks and protected areas covers over 17% of the country. Since independence, Namibians have chosen to increase our protected areas network, proclaiming new national parks and protecting the entire coastline of the country. That's over a thousand miles, including Namibia's first and vast marine protected areas. Increasingly, the links between national parks, people and international boundaries are coming together to make sound ecological sense. Kaza, the Kavango-Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area, is a perfect example of this. Kaza represents the world's largest international conservation area, larger than the state of California. It combines protected areas across five countries. These countries look beyond their national borders, achieving something collectively that they could not have achieved alone, and spreading the culture of conservation across international boundaries. Wildlife, including nearly half of the continent's elephants, roam freely across these borders. Throughout Namibia, wildlife populations are thriving. Namibia has the world's largest population of cheetah. We are the only country in the world where the population of free-roaming lions is increasing. And Namibians are passionate about the protection of our rhino. Comparing our wildlife recovery story to the decimation of species in much of the rest of the world, it is both staggering and humbling to realize the global importance of Namibia's conservation efforts. Forty-two percent means space. Sustainability. Endless horizons. It means adventure. From the pursuit of tigers in the Caprivi to the coast where the desert meets the sea, adventure abounds. For adrenaline junkies, adventure can be hard, really hard like a 100-kilometer race through the Fish River Canyon, the second largest canyon in the world, or a six-day cycle challenge through the Namib Desert. In Namibia, adventure takes you to places where your heart soars, to where you feel connected to the earth, and to yourself. Adventure is about more than an individual challenge. In Namibia, adventure tourism has changed a nation. I'm part of the 42%. It means jobs. Training. It means education. It means pride in the choices we've made. The culture of conservation in Namibia isn't new. It's been here for centuries, with the San, the Himba, and other indigenous people of Namibia. But today, it is being embraced by a larger and more diverse group of people than ever before. Part of the conservation effort is taking place on private land, where fences have come down and game farms have been established, including one of the largest private nature reserves in the world. But it's on communal land, in communal conservancies, where the landscape for conservation and social change has been altered most dramatically. The Namibian Community-Based Conservation Program started at grassroots level in the 1980s. After independence in 1990, policy changes enabled rural communities to make decisions on the use of their resources and benefit from wildlife by forming conservancies. The first four conservancies were registered in 1998. Today, there are over 75 conservancies, covering well over 18% of the country. 
and one in four rural Namibians is part of the Conservancy movement. Conservancies and community-based natural resource management is enabling the growth of a new rural economy, and the tourism industry has played a significant role in its success. Today, there are over 30 joint venture lodges operating in communal conservancies across Namibia. They provide jobs, training, income to conservancy members, and a tangible stake in the future. 42% is the result of visionary choices made by the people of Namibia. 42% represents space for great adventure, space for reflection, and space for great fun. 42% also allows for authentic experiences. Experiences that not only enrich the lives of our guests, but the lives of all Namibians. Namibia's culture of conservation has been called one of the most compelling stories in tourism today. This story is one that we are proud to share. Welcome to Namibia, to Africa at its best. I'm part of the 42%. 42% and counting.